Hello everyone. In this lesson, we are going to explore using the dot product to create a stylized motion blur deformation effect in Houdini and apply it to a Mixamo character. We'll prep our mesh with some of the modeling tools and then dive into the world of Vex and wind up with a hopefully somewhat usable user interface in the end. So grab a coffee or a burger and let's hang out and enjoy some quality computer time. For those of you who are looking to follow along with the model that I used, um, the model was obtained at Mixamo. I'm not able to include the model with the downloadable file because it's not okay for me to redistribute it, but I can tell you how to obtain it. Um, so you go to Mixamo, create an account if you don't have one, and then you should have something like this. There's a characters tab and an animations tab. Under the characters tab, we're gonna search for Maria. And we want Maria with prop, JJ Ong. Click that one, proceed, use this character, cool. And there she is, and then we go over to animations here, and we search for sword. And then the one we're gonna want is this great sword slash. And there it is. And then you just wanna click download, and I chose an FBX uh, file, just the first one there, and hit download. And there you go. All right, so first things first, let's import our Mixamo uh, character. So we're gonna go uh, file import filmbox FBX. And here next to my hip file, I have made an FBX folder and put the FBX file in there. We'll hit accept and import. And here it appears with a new um, sub network. If I hit spacebar F, it'll frame up the character and scrubbing the timeline, we can see the uh, animation. I could play too. And there we go. It's playing back a little bit fast. I'm gonna go down to the lower right here and hit the real time toggle. See it play back um, at 24 frames per second. Excellent. So that's the uh, sword slashing animation. What we'll do is we'll um, kind of do a little bit of work to clean up this sword and then we'll apply our effect to it. So let's hop inside here. Now here's the rig and it's kind of, I'll get that out of here. The rig is kind of um, scary at the moment, but this is just literally all the bones and joints that make up the body and uh, that make up the character. Um, and what we're interested with is this little section over here. We've got this, which is actually the character. And if we go up and over here, this is the sword. Um, now what I want to do is we've got um, this part of the network here, which is really bringing it back into the animation. Um, I want to start from this uh, point right here, and we can um, do a little bit of work. I'm going to turn off the texture. You can see that this is pretty triangulated at the moment. I'm going to just um, build out, build this out in uh, into some quads so that it works a little bit better with our effect. So let's first do a poly split. I'm going to come out to the end here. I'm going to turn this on flat wire shaded and I'm going to type, uh, let's, I'm going to hit the C key. Go up to model, polygons, poly split. And we're going to start here. We're going to go to there. And I'll hit enter. And that should have made a split for us there. I'm going to hit the W key to go into wireframe mode. I'm going to hit the D key and turn this to dark. Um, under the background, uh, just makes it easier for me to see. Um, and then I'm going to hit C, go up to model polygons, poly split again, and I'm going to um, anchor on that point and split over to that point and hit enter again. All right, so now we've sort of quadded off uh, this section here. Uh, the next thing I'm going to do is uh, get rid of these big tri triangles that are going along the sword. So let's switch to edge mode selection. I'll grab these two and that one there and that should be good and I'll just hit delete and you can see what it's doing over here is because I had this node selected when I started doing this it has um, it has effectively been um, you know building off of our network when I'm making these non procedural edits so, um, let's continue. 
Um, I just want a bunch of quads here because we're going to be deforming this and it needs, you know, the more the merrier. So let's do an edge loop. I'm going to type tab edge loop. There we go. And let's start um, going in this direction. I'll just put one in anywhere and then hit enter. And it's made a poly split for us again. I'm going to crank the number of loops up to let's do like, let's do 100. Cool. And then let's go up to the top here and add some more edge loops around the tip. Same thing. Hit tab, type edge loop, and we'll put that there. Anywhere is good. Hit select it over here. Crank this one up to 10. That's great. Then um, um, let's do some edge loops along the length of the sword. So I'm going to, uh, again, uh, edge loop. And we'll do one uh, here. Or actually, before I do this, I'm going to delete that one. Before I do this, I'm going to actually um, delete this top part so that it, uh, the loop can pass um, over the tip of the sword. So I'm just going to switch. I'm going to uh, switch. I'm, I'm in edge selection mode. I'm going to grab these three edges and hit delete. You can see it's dropped down a dissolve node. And if I hit the W key, it's got a nice um, primitive fa uh, face that it's put here at the end for us. So at least I can do, when I do my edge loop operations, I just only have to do two of them instead of four now. All right, so let's go uh, back to loop. And we'll start here. And then I'll select the poly split, crank the number of loops up to, let's do something like, yeah, that looks good. We'll do seven and then um, tab loop again, and we'll do it the exact same thing over here. Select the node and set this one to seven. So now we've got some, um, pretty nice quadded, uh, stuff going on over here. Um, I'm going to just hop out to the end here. And what I want to do is just fuse the tip together, back together. Um, so that should be good. Um, before I do this though, I actually want this to be a little bit sharper. And if I fuse this tip, it's going to kind of come to almost like a, a duller edge. So I'm going to pop all the way back up to this dissolve where I, right before the dissolve where I, where I deleted the, um, end off of it. And if I select this, uh, poly split right here, I should be able to continue to work on our network and hopefully it'll all work out. But I'm going to uh, grab uh, this edge. I'm going to go into edges mode. All right, so I'm going to go out here. I'm going to go back and hit W, go into wireframe mode. So I've got my um, edge mode. I'm going to hold A, middle mouse click. It does the loop selection. I'm going to type tab, edit. And then I'm going to slide along that edge there. And it looks like it actually slid along the surface without me having to um, say anything about it, which is, that's fine. But I just want to bring this out so that it makes a nice sharp end. So when we delete this last portion and then we finally fuse it, it's it, it, we end up with a very sharp result. So I'm going to go back to the dissolve. Yeah, that's getting rid of this, and then let's go all the way back down here. Poly, split, fill. Okay, that's good. Yeah, and you can see that it's that it has um, maintained that uh, nice, really sharp edge. All right, cool. So um, now I'm going to just grab uh, points. So select points mode. I'm just going to select all the points that are clustered at the end there. Tab and type down fuse. It's going to drop a fuse. And if you look really closely, when I crank up the tolerant the distance on this fuse until all the points collapse into one. And there we are. Okay, so I think that this is um, good enough for right now. And um, we'll just simply let it go through the rest of its network. We can always come back and change it some more if we need to. Yeah, I'll put down a null down here that we can refer to. And this will be called um, out.
sword. Awesome. So now let's create a new geometry network and import this, uh, this model into, and we can do all of our um, stuff in there. So I'm going to hit tab and write geo for geometry. And we'll call this Mobler Deformer. And let's hop inside. Don't need the file node. Let's merge. Oops, not, mer not regular merge. We're going to do an object merge. And we're going to grab inside of the greatsword slash FBX. We're going to go down until we can see our um, Maria uh, JJ Ong. I'm not sure how to pronounce that. Um, I'm going to grab this one and accept. And then we'll make another object merge. I'll just uh, option drag that off to the side. And then we will select the sword, out sword, accept. And for both of these, I'm going to select into this object to transform into this object. And then we can merge them together to view the result of both of our sections um, imported. Um, now I'll turn off wireframe mode. And if we hit play, yeah, our geometry should be in here and everything is looking good. Awesome. I'm going to just set up a couple groups here so that we can easily, you know, discern between what part is the body versus what part is the sword. Um, so let's put down a group. And over here, um, we're going to group and call this group the uh, body group. And then this group over here, which will be not the body group, but the sword group. And awesome. So now that we've got that all merged up, this is actually um, because Houdini is in uh, units of meters, this person is gigantic. So I'm going to throw down a transform and bring it back down to sort of Houdini scale and the size that I found that represented that the best was 0.01, a hundredth of the size. Now she's back to being the right size. Okay, and so now we've got motion, um, we've got her moving. The next thing we need is we need to get velocity information. We don't really have, if we look down at our um, attributes here, our point attributes, we've got normals and we've got position. You can see the normals like so. If I um, hit the D key and turn up the visual um, on the guides, um, my normals are scaled to point 0.2. I'm just going to turn them up a bit higher so I can see them. And uh, there they are. Um, so we've got our normals, and but we don't have a velocity vector. Our velocity vector is usually here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to set up, a, I'm going to throw it on a trail and wire that in here and activate it. And I, instead of uh, trailing, I'm just going to compute velocity. And if I turn on this, uh, this little icon right here, uh, display point trails, you can see it's actually kind of making a nice, you know, trail with the motion. I'm going to yeah, we'll do that. Cool. All right. Yeah. So you can kind of see th where we're headed with this. What we could do is we could do something like, say, um, however fast I'm moving, I want you to move me back by a certain amount of my velocity. So let's get started doing something with this. Let's just throw, this is mostly going to take place inside of a wrangle. So let's throw it on a wrangle and wire that in. And we've got our, you know, velocity attribute here, which is cool. So let's try to play around. I'm going to turn off this vector real quick and then we will um, type, uh, let's just create first off a global multiplier to kind of scale the effect. So we'll do float um, mult and set that equal to uh, float channel uh, global multiplier. And hit this little button here. It'll create a slider for us. It doesn't do anything because we haven't told it to do anything yet. Um, so just to kind of get some sort of feedback, let's move each point along the velocity vector by a multiplier that we've defined here. So let's go down here and say um, at P minus equals at V, 
um, times malt. Simple enough. And now if we grab our multiplier, you can see with these, whoops, with these velocity vectors, when we start to scale this effect, you can see that it's actually pushing all the geometry back <laughs> until it gets looking really ridiculous, but in the direction of the velocity vector. So you could, if you're, if you're after something really wonky and weird looking, I mean, you could go with this. I mean, that looks pretty great, right? <laughs> Just wobbling, crazy mess of a person. And you could uh, do, if this is what you're after, you know, it's, you know, time for sushi. You're ready to rock. But um, let's try and uh, dial this in a little bit to make more of an um, actual motion blur effect. So we're going to go, I'm going to bring this multiplier down for right now. So let's pause on this first slash here and kind of analyze things a little bit. So we've got our velocity trails and we've got our normals. Now I'm going to just change the view of the velocity slightly so that we can actually um, view forward vectors um, as, alongside our normals and make them slightly different color. So I'm going to turn off the velocity trail. I'm going to come down here um, and right click on this little uh, visualizer. And under scene, I'm going to hit the plus and add a new marker. And under here, I'm going to call this velocity. I'll give it a color of, let's say, orange. And we're going to select the attribute V. And then that will create, uh, that's creating text. We don't want text. It's just writing out the velocity vector. We're going to actually add a, a vector. Um, and it's pretty big. So we'll just bring the length scale down to something that makes a little bit more sense. Excellent. So. Now, when we go over here and I switch this to wireframe mode, you can see that we've got a bunch of velocity vectors that are pointing in the direction of motion. And we also have normals that some of them are pointing away from the direction of motion and some of them are aligned with the direction of motion. And we can actually use this information to determine, you know, we can say, you know, hey, if you're if you're that leading edge that is going in the direction of the velocity, I don't want anything to happen to you. I want a nice clean leading edge, but behind, if you're facing away from the direction of motion, I want this to be a nice um, stretched out. I, I want this to be a nice stretched out value. Um, so one way to do that is to use a dot product. The name sounds scary, but it's a lot simpler to use in practice. Um, Basically what it means is if the two vectors are perfectly aligned with one another, the dot product yields a value of one. If the um, vectors are perpendicular to one another, you'll get the value of zero. And if the vectors are completely facing away from one another, you'll get a value of negative one. So what we can say is, hey, if the dot product is less than zero, I want you to deform it by some amount of the velocity. Let's write it out. So we're going to create a new variable for, for normalized velocity. It's going to be vector. Uh, we'll call it NV for normalized velocity. And it's going to be equal to normalize the V attribute. Then what we'll do is we will um, create the dot product. And we'll say the dot product will give us a float value, so we're going to create a float. And it's going to be a dot. It's going to be dot is equal to the dot of um, nv and at n. And n should already be normalized. So, all right, now that we have this, let's plug that in. I'm going to take this value, we're going to bring it down here, and we're going to say v times malt. And basically, our dot product is going to be acting as a multiplier upon that. So we're just going to multiply this all times dot. So now, if we zoom away, you can see our global multiplier, when we start applying it, it's actually starting to deform this, uh, it's starting to deform the sword. But it's doing it kind of in a way we don't want to. Remember how we were saying before that we just want to um, affect um, the edges that are moving away from the direction of motion, well, we have to kind of clamp this off. So to do that, we're going to create a new variable called mask. And the mask is going to simply be 
the uh, clamped value. So when you put down a clamp function, that basically takes um, a value, which we're going to feed it the dot value. And we're going to say, limit the amount of the dot value to be within these two uh, numbers. And that's going to be negative 1 and 0. So anything that's over 0 is going to immediately be cut off to 0. Anything less than 1, there won't be anything less than 1. But if there was anything less than 1, it's going to max out or minimum out at negative 1. All right, let's do that. Now, instead of using our dot down here, we're going to just replace it with our mask. And now when we multiply, you can see that it's actually starting to move these sections of our sword back a little bit, you know? If we uh, come back here, let's crank the multiplier up a little ways, and let's, let's play this out a little bit and see what it looks like. You can see it's starting to generate what kind of looks like a nice motion blur effect. Now, it's kind of jaggy over here. Um, if we go back to our initial slash, you can see that it's kind of, you know, we've it's got messed up stuff going on because if we go back to our undeformed surface, there's like our normals are going in all sorts of different directions. Around here, you can see that they're kind of splitting. So we're going to do a little bit more work on this sword to smooth this out. So let's go back up here, and if I grab this uh, sword, out sword, I'm gonna just hit this little arrow key to jump into that network. Okay, so where were we? The last thing we really did was we fused our sword. I'm gonna just move this over here. Um, so let's turn off these normals. I'm going to, actually, I'm gonna leave these on. So what I'm gonna do here is, you can see our normals are very much oriented to um, these surfaces of this sword, and it's creating, um, there isn't a lot of variation, and it isn't very smooth, and the smoother this is, the better of a result we're going to get. And we have all these quads that we made, so let's take advantage of them. I'm gonna throw down an attribute blur. And what attribute blur does is it basically allows you to smooth out um, smooth out the, uh, um, the values of your normals. So let's, Let's activate that. And by default, it's going to be smoothing out the uh, position. You can see right here. So if I crank, crank this up, you can see it really starts to smooth out the position of all those, uh, of all those points. But we can do a different attribute. Let's add N. And now if we look at this nice angular shape that we're getting here with, these, uh, with this sword, um, and we start to uh, crank up the blurring iterations, you can see it starts to round out those normals so that they start to kind of, you know, fit around a nice shape. So now let's hop back to our other network. I'm going to go hit the back key here. Here we are. Hit the um, space F key. And you can see that our, um, our deformation has been way, is way more smooth now. One thing I'm worried about that I'm not quite sure happened is um, the dot product works best if you feed in two normalized vectors, and I don't think that our n is normalized anymore. Our no I don't think our normal is normalized anymore. So I'm going to uh, go up here. I'm going to drop down another vector and just uh, normalize it real quick. It's going to be n lowercase n uppercase n equals normalize at n. And there we go. It doesn't look like it made any difference, but that just makes me feel better. So we're just going to go with it. Cool. What else can we do here? Now I see, you know, when we, when we play this back, it looks like it's affecting her body. So if I, you know, there's various ways I can control that. If one of the ways I can say is, you know, we're getting some sort of, uh, deformation around her hands. If I don't want that, I did create this uh, group up here for her body and for the sword. I could come down to this attribute wrangle and simply select the sword group. And now we're only deforming the sword, which is fine. We'll just do that for now. Um, that looks cool. And uh, so wh what else can we do? Maybe what we could do is we could analyze the speed of the sword. How fast is it moving? The faster it's moving, it's going to be moving faster at the end of the sword. Um, you know, we can use that as a value to drive a ramp. Uh, okay, so let's, uh, let's add that in here. Before I do this position adjustment, I actually want to take all of these, this value and um, assign it to a new variable. So I'm going to uh, go down here. I'm going to type down a vector since this, uh, since uh, the right side of the equation of a position uh, has to be uh, a vector. So I'm going to write down vector displacement and set this 
I'm going to cut this, paste it up here. And down here, we're going to say minus equals displacement. And nothing should happen. It's good. It's all, it's all still working. Excellent. So now when we do all of our um, you know formulas and stuff, we can just build on and add multipliers to uh, this uh, section right here. And then ultimately apply it to the displacement. And you'll see why in a little bit we're going to actually use the placement, displacement uh, variable to do something else. But first, what we need to do is we need to measure the speed of our um, points. So to do that, we can simply look at the length of the velocity vector. So I'm going to create a new attribute, float attribute um, speed equals the length of the velocity. Now, if I go over here into my attribute spreadsheet, you can see a lot of these points have a speed of zero, which is fine. Um, if I sort by the speed, you can see that um, our maximum speed is like 31-ish, and then it all kind of goes down to nothing. Um, so we got 31. Um, that's good. So we know if our speed is ranging from zero to 31, if we fit of the speed value from 0 to 31 in between 0 and 1, we can easily apply it to a ramp. Let's, um, let's create a new uh, input variable. I'm going to say float v max equals chf max velo velocity. And I'll hit this little uh, icon again. And now we have our max velocity. Cool. So before we use that, then the next thing I'm going to want to do is fit the speed between um, zero and whatever this max velocity is. So we're going to say float vmap equals fit speed from zero to vmax which is the input minimum and input maximum. And then we're going to fit it to our output minimum and output maximum of 0 and 1, respectively. Cool. Now that we have speed fit between a value of 0 and 1, we don't have it fit between a value of 0 and 1 yet. But if I go here, I see speed is 30, maximum speed is 31.5795. We'll just uh, control C that, bring it over to max velocity. Control V it. Looks like it created a paragraph icon there. Just like that. Cool. Now we've got our max velocity um, put in here. And um, so now we know that our speed is ranging from 0 to 1. Next, we put it into a ramp. We'll say float V ramp. And we'll set that equal to uh, CH ramp. And we'll call it velocity ramp. Oh, and the other parameter we have to do is vmap. So it's going to be using vmap to drive the ramp, essentially. And then if I click this guy over here again, it's created a ramp for us. Awesome. Um, now, now all we have to do to use that ramp is we just have to multiply it in it as well. So put down vramp here. And... Should be good. See, now we've kind of got a curve here. You can see it's gradually getting more intense as we move into higher values. So you can really start to shape this over here. You know, you could give it like a, you know, I want it to have like sort of a weird shape like that. Um, whatever works. Let's try using some B, spl um, B splines to uh, get sort of a cool shape here. Let's go grab this notch and select a B spline. Let's grab this one, select B spline. And this one, select B spline. You can see it starts to make like a nice curve. And now we can start to add like little, um, you know, just a little character to the edge of our sword slash. And let's go back like this, like that. Maybe go like that. Have this kind of taper off here. Yeah, it's looking cool. And this is all just sort of happening in the viewport in real time. I mean, if you had UVs, they would probably be getting stretched out. But, I mean, your texture would sort of be behaving probably, hopefully. And, you know, you can kind of just 
sculpt the shape of this nice deformation effect. I don't know what you'd want to use it for, but it's just kind of a fun exercise. So let's play it back and see what it looks like. Let's go over here and hit the play key. And yeah, it's cool. We totally have this like nice sword slashing effect going through the air and we can crank, um, we can kind of crank it up and see what it looks like if we make it go even higher and it gets kind of ridiculous, but it looks like some cool slashes, you know? Cool. So one more trick that I want to do, um, let's turn off this, go to smooth shaded mode. Let's put down a normal so that we can kind of get a little bit def a little bit of definition back into our sword. So on normal. Wire that in, highlight it, and that's looking good. There's a little weirdness going on at the edge there. I'm going to just crank up this, and we don't really want to be affecting the character too much, so I'm going to select the sword group, and now it's only selecting our sword group. If I turn this um, on and off, you can kind of see it brings back some of the definition of our sword. Um, let's do one more trick. Uh, we've got like our nice um, deformation, uh, motion blur deformation happening here. Um, let's just give it a little bit of a fade off effect. Let's handle it by using the amount of displacement. So we'll say if these, depending on how much this point has been displaced, let's affect the alpha of the um, point. So let's go down here and we will put down a, say that alpha equals, alpha equals, um, length of our displacement. Um, but you can see that that's actually kind of backwards. Um, our displacement, as our displacement increases, we actually want the alpha to decrease. So we know that when displacement is zero, alpha should be 100%, 100%. So if we put down a one minus length, you can see that now it's starting to fade away. I don't feel like this is actually fit to the right range. So I'm going to create another um, alpha threshold for us. And we'll call it uh, float. Uh, float D max, which stands for the max displacement, is equal to a channel function um, alpha map. Then what I will do is I'll use a fit function here. So we're going to right float fit disp to fit the displacement. I'm going to take this thing that we created here. I'm going to cut it and we're going to write fit length of the displacement between zero and D max. And we want to make sure that it fits between zero and one because alpha values run from zero to one, like many things in computers. And so now we can go down here and say alpha equals one minus fit disp. Hit this little icon right here and we get a new alpha map value. Now we can kind of dial in how much our um, alpha is being cut away by the displacement amount. And just for giggles, why not make this an option that we can turn on and off? So we'll create a new parameter. I'm going to go up here into edit parameter interface. And I'm going to put down a toggle. So select toggle, hit this arrow key, puts it over here. We're going to say for the label, use alpha question mark. And then we'll go up to the parm and call it use alpha. And then we'll hit apply and accept. And down here, it has created a nice little uh, dot for us. I actually want to go back into the parameter interface and put it right above the alpha map. And also, why not put down a little um, a little uh, separator so that we can kind of um, denote that you know our sort of velocity shaping is happening up here, and then this is a separate function down here. Let apply, accept, and you can see it's kind of dropped this down a little bit. Put a little line in there. Cool. So use alpha checkbox doesn't really do anything. Um, what we can do is put an if statement down. After this, we can say if chi channel for integer. And what we did was we set this, if we hover over it, we set it to use alpha. So chi use alpha. If that is equal to one, 
then do this. And that broke it because I didn't put another parenthesis to close the whole thing off. So there we go. Now we've got a toggle. If we want to use alpha, tick it on, tick it off. Nice. Um, but we can tick it off and we can still move the alpha mat. That's not cool. Let's make it so that this alpha checkbox disables our alpha map. I'll uh, go back into edit parameter interface and go to our alpha map. And we're going to say disable when open bracket use alpha equals zero. When use alpha is turned off, that will make it so that this value is grayed out. Hit apply and accept. Now when I untick use alpha, I can't do anything. Nice. So it's on. We can adjust it. It's off. We're locked out. Locked out for good. All right. Cool. So that's it. That's uh, sort of, that's the effect. And I um, hope you had fun. I hope you learned something cool about dot products and one of the practical uses of uh, dot products um, or impractical, depending on how you're looking at it. But yeah, thanks for watching. And I hope that you guys have an awesome time playing around in Houdini.